Hello again, Ash here. Welcome back to What Do You Know About, the podcast where chaos and dark history seems to reign. Last week we focused on the lighter topic of music, or so it was planned until I derailed it slightly with our new favorite music festival, Woodstock. Yeah, just just slightly. Yeah, just slightly, right? (laughs) (laughs) But today I'm going to start off a fairly light topic with my personal journalistic hero, Nellie Bly. While she did uncover some pretty dark and seedy things, she was a trailblazer and a woman that we should all really look up to. Then we go dark again while Kat talks about Synanon, a cult that, from what I gather from last week, targeted teenagers. Am I warm, Kat? Uh, it, it didn't start with teenagers, but it ended there. Okay, good to know. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. <laughs> okay, okay. But before we start, I do want to give an update to information that I hadn't quite gotten to when we talked about tragic movie sets a few episodes ago. Because of the timing, I didn't get too far into the legal aspect of the Twilight Zone movie, but one of my new favorite law tubers, who I found when looking for coverage of the Manson v. Wood v. Gore lawsuit, reposted a video that she had done in 2020 on that exact tragedy. In her video, she really focused on the trial itself against five main crew members of this film shoot, including the director, John Landis. The trial was the first time that a film was being looked at as criminally responsible for the death of anyone on set, and it was insane. The prosecutor for the families of the victims actually suspects that the defense orchestrated the jury to acquit all five men by having celebrities in the room and making them think that Landis was scribbling down a script of the proceedings where the jury could play themselves in a major motion picture. I'm... wait, what? (sighs) So according to, like, the prosecutor for the families, um, John Landis spent the entire time of the trial just sitting there with a yellow notepad scribbling stuff down. And she had heard from other people that that they had told the jury that they could, that he was writing a script and that they could star in it as themselves about this trial. What the fuck? Like, that, I... uh... I, oh, yeah. I'm already broken. Like, that I don't want to believe that these speculations by people, like, who were there could be true, but honestly, yes. a jury isn't going to be completely nonpartisan, and we've probably seen that in the Depp v. Heard trial, and would probably see it with an Alec Baldwin twi- trial if that goes through, and we'll also likely see it in a Manson v. Wood v. Gore trial as well. Like, there's only so much you can do to ensure bipartisanship, but, like... I mean, that's just cold to even suggest that. Like, that's, like, just the disrespect is just awful. What the hell? Yeah. Even though the five men responsible for the safety of the actor and two children didn't get the consequences that they deserved, at least it did bring forth more safety measures, as I discussed in the episode, and it kickstarted the likelihood for a criminal trial when filmmakers and crew are negligent on sets leading to the loss of lives. Um, but I just wanted to, like, share that because I was like, you're kidding me that this is what possibly happened in a courtroom because it was, like, a celebrity Mm -hmm. trial. Yikes. Just yikes. (laughs) All right. So, now, last week we had a bit of a mishap with forgetting to do our fun facts. So, let's get back on track and start off correctly once again. (laughs) Uh, Okay. So, since I was researching a trailblazing woman journalist... My fun fact is all about women in the journalism field. Shocking, right? Nice. So, women have been journalists for longer than we think, but I'm going to focus my fun fact on female journalists from Canada. Okay. Um, One of our first Canadian journalists was also the world's first female war correspondent. Oh. Kit Coleman was born in Ireland in 1859 before immigrating to Canada in 1884 as a widow, when her only child and her husband died in quick succession of each other. Mm. She worked as a secretary until she married her boss and had two children. In 1889, her second husband passed away, so she began writing articles for local magazines in order to support her two kids. By 1890, she moved to Toronto and became the first female journalist in Canada to have her own section of a newspaper called Kit of the Mail. Wow. The Toronto Mail quickly hired her, and she got a seven-page weekly column called Women's Kingdom. Like my darling Nellie Bly, she started writing out about the, like, the lighter topics that women were supposed to write about back then. 
um, but then started to dive into topics like social reform, domestic violence, and poor working conditions for women. The Prime Minister at the time, Wilfrid Laurier, was a huge fan of her, as were the majority of Canadians and anyone else who got their hands on a copy of the paper. In 1894, awesome. an American even commented that no journalist of either gender had more of a direct influence on North American newspapers than her. Oh, so she went in and she went in big. She went in huge. When she volunteered to go cover the Spanish-American War in Cuba, the Toronto Mail agreed because of the publicity it would bring and told her to write the fluff as it was too dangerous for a woman on the front. The Americans, however, didn't see it that way, and she was given her war correspondence accreditation, becoming the first female to do so. After yeah, the war, girl. She, right? After the war, <laughs> she was one of the founders of the Canadian Women's Press Club, which sadly was unincorporated in two thousand and four. Ah, but she no, like, like that's really cool. She like pushed for Canadian <laughs> journalists, and the only reason that it was like unincorporated. Um, is because they, they're like, we aren't really needed anymore. Women actually can, like, do journalism, and they're fairly balanced with their male counterparts. They're allowed to be hired, and there's less outright direct sexism than there was. Yeah. Which there's probably, like, if anyone's listening right now and going, like, uh, there's still lots. Like, I don't disagree, but if we just compare it to where we came from, then, like, there is a there is a clear difference. We're at least seeing more, and like we're able to cover a variety of subjects and like yeah. not stick to fluff. Exactly. I love that she started with like the stereotypically or like the the stuff that was like deemed appropriate for women to start with. It feels like she's playing the game. Like she knew what she was doing. Yeah. Like yeah, I'll I'll get my foot in the door by writing what you want me to write about, and then I'm gonna go and do my thing once I'm here. Okay. 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 Yeah. Good. Okay. She's a five. I like her. Yeah, I was like, I was like, okay, shoot, like, I want to, like, talk about this one now, too, <laughs> as I'm, like, reading more about <laughs> her, but I'm like, I'm gonna have to stick with Nellie as for my main thing. <laughs> yeah. But also do, like, a paragraph about <laughs> Kit. Maybe she's a good, uh, maybe she's a good subject for an episode later. <laughs> I'm thinking so. Or at least, like, an episode on, like, Canadian journalists. Because mm, there's be a cool. few of them that are pretty good. All right. Do you, want, uh, do you want me to share my fun fact now, or do we want to save that for when it's my turn to tell my story? We can share it now. Yeah? Okay. So, my fun fact, which we're not going to understand uh, the context of until much later in this episode, um, George Lucas uh, is kind of ends up getting his name affiliated with Synanon. Very, very early George Lucas. He needed a few dozen actors with shaved heads for a sci-fi dystopian film called THX 1138. Uh, but was having trouble finding actors who were willing to cut their hair for the role. Um, you know, actors largely about appearance would, you know, drastically change it for this. Uh, but luckily for him, he found Synanon, which by that time was a full cult, and among other things, members would shave their heads to express solidarity with the cult. Fortunately for Lucas, they were willing to take on the work, and he had enough actors to film his first sci-fi film, which was ironically about a society where everyone was controlled by drugs, which is ironic because Synodon started as a rehab center. What is so, up with George Lucas? Because, like, he even was, like, on board for the Twilight Zone director during that whole thing and everything. So I okay. So there's a lot of public perception stuff about Synanon that we're gonna talk about later. So I doubt that he totally understood what was going on. Most people didn't. Most people thought it was something very different from what was actually happening. Um, well, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> oh my god! I don't think he like knew or was involved or anything with Synanon. That was the this is the only connection that he has to it. Was just that he uh, hired a bunch of people from there. That's it. But still. <laughs> well, yeah, he did kind of, in a roundabout way, sort of fund it. I didn't find any sources discrediting this, but it is the kind of story that I'm like, mm. Yeah, because I'm like, I'm it hearing about George. It seems a little copy page. Like, I'm not, like, yeah. Like, I can't claim, like, a thousand, with, like, a thousand percent certainty that this is exactly how it went down. Uh, but I didn't find anything discrediting this, so. Yeah, because I'm like, I'm hearing about George well. so much lately. Because I'm like, he was like part of like the whole Twilight Zone thing. He's part of this thing now. He was, he, he um, basically 
was like the reason that the director for Return to Oz got to be the director for Return to Oz because they, they wanted to like change him out and George Lucas was like, no, you need him and stuff. And I'm like, he's everywhere at the moment. <laughs> He's got a big impact in Hollywood at, around this time. Like he, like he was a, he was, he was, is like a huge figure. Well, it makes sense he'd be involved in a lot of crazy stuff. That's Hollywood true. is a crazy place. So if you're big, if you're a big name there, you're involved in a lot of crazy stuff just by nature. That's true, and we will get into that next week with our episode about the crazy nature of Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> All right. True. Let's All get right. into the story of Nellie Bly, shall we? Yeah. Okay. So, Nellie has always been one of my favorite female journalists, and I've been looking into translating one of her fa most famous articles, Ten Days in a Madhouse, into like a book or play or slash musical for years. Um, but today I'm going to share some of the, the details of her life and how freaking strong of a woman she was. But first off, Kat, what do you know <laughs> about Nellie Bly? Uh, the only thing I know about Nellie Bly, um, I know from... It must have been like late middle school, early high school, where I read a uh, an illustrated, like one of the like first chapter books, like a really early novel about Nellie Bly, um, that basically just told the story about like ten days in the madhouse, um, and that was more or less it. Like I know she was a journalist. I know she did that whole thing, and like wrote like a massive expose on it and stuff like that. And it like had a huge impact on society and how we see asylums um but that's like the only story of hers that i know okay yeah like i know she she, wrote, I she's done more <laughs> she wrote a lot <laughs> and had like a major impact with a lot of different things yeah but let's start off with her early life so nelly was born as elizabeth jane cochran on may 5th 1864 in cochran's mill pennsylvania her father was the son of Irish immigrants, and he became a local politician, judge, and land flipper. In, <laughs> like, it's like house flipping, but he flipped land. All right, okay. So, like, he would buy the land, build the house, oh, get okay. it ready for, like, agricultural stuff and things like that, and then sell it. Okay. And then I, go buy I, more I was land. Imagining just like, because I was imagining just, like, swampy empty fields that he would come in and like polish up into being like a pretty field and now you start you're selling a pretty field building a house on it makes more sense yeah <laughs> i'm like building a pretty field wasn't going to get him much when they're trying to like build a community we'll a tree orchard over there and that'll raise the property value by like so much <laughs> like walking around with a starbucks telling the people where to go i like I, I don't know i just i had a whole house flippers mentality like no. <laughs> so, that makes more sense. in 1855, the people of Pitts Mills renamed their little town after him because he contributed to the town so much with his businesses. Nellie was the 13th child in the family. Her father's first wife gave birth to 10 children, while his second wife, Nellie's mother, gave birth to two boys, Nellie, and then two more kids after Nellie. Because Nellie was her mother's first girl, she stood out in their small town like a sore thumb. All the other girls were wearing dull gray and brown dresses, while Nellie was dressed in bright pink. Aww. Uh, the color soon became her favorite color, and for the rest of her life, she actually called herself Pink or Pinky Cochran as a nickname. Aww. That's cute. Uh, yeah, so Nellie's father passed away when she was six years old after becoming ill. The family was devastated, not just from grief, but from the fact that Mr. Cochran didn't leave a will to determine how to split his inheritance between 14 children. The eldest oh, died no. while serving as a Union soldier in the Civil War, so it went from 15 to 14 that had to split all of this up. Oh my goodness. So a judge decided that the money would be split evenly between all the kids, and then the surviving mother would get an allowance of $16 a week to run the household with. At the time, that was... And then that was, like, yeah. enough. <laughs> like, at the time, okay. that was more than what a factory worker would earn, but far less than what the family was used to, because they were, mm. like, fairly wealthy. Right, fair enough. Um, at 15 years old, Nellie decided to become a teacher to help with the income. While in school, she added an E to the end of her last name in order to sound and look more distinguished. Later, her siblings and her mother five. would do the same. That's cute. 
Uh, sadly, she had to leave school after the first year as the banker in charge of their money lied about how much she had and she ended up unable to pay her tuition. What? Yeah. She oh, later attempted to sue the banker for misusing her funds, but the trial dragged on and on, so she eventually dropped it, which was common at the time due to how women were seen in the society. In January of 1885, Nellie read a series of columns in the local newspaper by Erasmus Wilson. Wilson commonly wrote about how women should be outside of the workplace and inside of the house. According to him, a woman's mission in life was to be a helpmate to a man, not to compete with him. Oh, please. Just the term helpmate is very help interesting. Mate. A helpmate. <laughs> like, so what the hell does that mean? To be a helpmate. Nellie had watched her mother in an abusive marriage after her father's death. So this oh. column made her extremely angry at the idea that a woman should have to depend on a man. Mm -hmm. She did what any woman should do with that anger. She put a pencil to her temple, connected it to her brain, and wrote a letter to the editor stating her opinions. If your pettiness and spite is not like your main driving force towards success, then I can't relate to you. Like, <laughs> like honestly, Nellie, just like, same. <laughs> right? So, she signed it as Lonely Orphan Girl and didn't include her name or address on it. The editor of the paper, George Madden, was so enthralled with the letter that he put a notice in the paper, like, just days after, asking for the author of the letter to send her name and address so they could give her a favor and the information that she so desired. Ooh. Rather than following the instructions of passing her information on, Nellie showed up at the office in person. Damn, that is a power move. So apparently, like, like no, you won't contact me, I will contact you. Thank you. So apparently, like, according to the journalist who had written, like, these columns, she was, like, super shy and stuff. But then once she kind of got alone with Madden and became, like, a bit more comfortable, yeah. um, she, like, her personality just shone through. And after a meeting with Madden, she was given space for her own article about the women's sphere. It was her first journalistic assignment. Yeah, girl. Um, January 25th, 1885, readers of the Pittsburgh Dispatch found an article on page 11 that started a career of a lifetime. The article was titled The Girl Puzzle, with the byline of Orphan Girl. Nellie's writing was relatable and easy to digest as she pleaded with readers to consider the widows and unmarried women who weren't given the life that other more beautiful, talented, and wealthy women were. She pushed mm -hmm. that those women needed to be able to make a living like their male counterparts could. In her words, let a youth start as an errand boy and he will work his way up until he is one of the firm. Girls are just as smart, a great deal quicker to learn. Why then can they not do the same? Yes. Yes. Early feminism. I am here for so much of it. Right. <clears throat> Her next article, printed on February 1st, 1885, was on divorce, and the byline became the name that everyone would remember for years to come, Nellie Bly. At the time, most women didn't write with their real names, as either like a safety precaution against men who didn't really want to hear from women, or as a way of getting published in a male-dominant profession. So like, there's like some journalists yeah. and stuff who would take their husband's names, but be writing themselves, right? Yeah. The name Nellie Bly became one of the most famous pen names when Madden called out to his staff for suggestions. Nellie Bly, spelt out N-E-L-L-Y, was a popular song of the 1800s by a Pittsburgh native named Stephen Collins Foster. The song was about the daughter of a former slave that was a servant of Foster's friend. Madden loved the suggestion and it went to print, spelling Nellie as N-E-L-L-I-E -L -L -E by mistake. So that's where her spelling comes from, because he just didn't spell it right. Oh my word. Um, it came from a typo. <laughs> yeah. Nellie's next article got her a permanent job at the paper, where she made $5 a week. The article focused on the social lives of the poor working, working women from eight different factories. It shed light on the extreme conditions that these women went through, including how they would work 12 plus hour days for an average pay of a dollar a day. 
A dollar a day for 12 hours. 12 or more hours. 12 or more. And you said, okay, and you said that $16 a week was, like, average for, a, like, a factory worker for, like, a man. Yeah. So, so that's, like, more than double. That's, like, almost, no, that's, like, three times as much as what a woman would be making a day. Yeah. And they're working longer, more tedious hours. Yeah. Oh, my word. Oh, that's infuriating. Ugh. You're about to be even more infuriated. Oh, no. While this article proved that she could handle more gritty material, she was mainly assigned to the quote-unquote womanly articles that covered everything from gardening to fashion. Oh, my God. It's like we know that you just wrote this amazing expose and, like, made some really, really good points and how we should change society and stuff, but what if you stick to fashion, though? Yeah. But, all right, can I talk about the textile industry next? Let's, uh, let's, let's tackle that. <laughs> That's fashion. Right. So by the end of 1885, she left the, ditch pa the dispatch to find articles that would actually make a change for other women. She was 21 at this time. <laughs> yes! Her new freelance career really kick-started the articles that Nellie is known for now. While working at the dispatch, she had met some Mexican visitors who invited her to come see the country. She jumped at the opportunity and pitched a series of articles to Madden. Madden was hesitant, but eventually agreed to publish them as she was adamant that the American society needed to know more about their southern neighbors. The six-month trip ended with Nellie being forced to flee Mexico after she wrote an article about a journalist who was imprisoned by the dictator Porifio Diaz. By reporting on the circumstances of Mexico during this era, she risked being imprisoned herself, and it got to the point where her life was literally on the line if she ever set foot in Mexico again during the Diaz reign. Holy. So she, again, like, went in and went, like, just dove into the industry, went big, and then just, like, full-on went for it. Like, yeah. Oh, my word. Her reports Holy. became a full book called Six Months in Mexico, and it detailed everything she witnessed about daily life in Mexico, from cultural differences to illegal activities and the frenzy that was playing the lottery. Okay. Yeah. And I think that was I, actually, yeah. like, her first, like, published book. Wow. Soon after, Nellie got herself a position writing for one of the biggest newspapers of the time, the New York World, run by Pulitzer himself. If anyone listening is a musical theater fan like we are, you'll recognize the names from the hit Disney musical Newsies. I fully believe that Catherine Plummer is based on Nellie, even though she is technically named after Pulitzer's daughter, Catherine Ethel, who died of pneumonia at the age of two. But, like, the actual role of Catherine Plummer is very much like Nellie Bly. I wonder if maybe... So they gave her the name of... Pulitzer's daughter, I wonder if they maybe thought that maybe that's who she would grow up into and having the inspiration in Ellie Bly, of course, maybe that's the kind of person that she would have ended up becoming. This is purely yeah. just a thousand percent speculation, but that'd be an interesting concept. Yeah, like, Catherine Plummer's song in the musical, like, I completely think of Nellie Bly as she's just like, I don't know what I'm gonna do, I don't know how to title this, like, and then, like, what are these men gonna think when I come out with this <laughs> article about these newsies? Yeah. Like, yeah. So I'm fully, I'm fully uh, here for it, and I will make it canon. <laughs> <laughs> most of Nellie's most famous articles came from this period of her career. Ten Days in a Madhouse being one of the top before her trip around the world in November of 1889, which set a record of 72 days, 6 hours, 11 minutes, and 14 seconds. The trip was published in the newspaper as well as in a detailed book that was an instant hit with people of the time. Because these articles are so well known though, I want to focus on some of the less well known articles that Nellie wrote. We did talk briefly about one um, on an earlier episode when we talked about Eva Hamilton. I do want to make it clear that Nellie was writing a lot of these articles in the late 1800s and very early 1900s. Society at the time had a very different point of view, and Nellie was actually quite ahead of her time with how she treated some of these very controversial topics. But she isn't perfect, and there will be opinions or ways that she comes at this, these topics that we aren't going to agree with today. 
An example of this is how she starts her article called Deaf, Dumb, and Blind about a young woman that she met when she toured an institution for the blind. As someone who is disabled myself, including an auditory processing disorder, I find this quote that I'm about to share to be grating on my nerves. How I look at it, however, is that it is way better than most of the rest of society would be reacting upon meeting this young lady. Okay, here he goes. I came to Boston to see Bette Noire of my childhood days. I have seen her, and she has made me feel tenfold the force of that early lesson. If she could accomplish so much, I thought, while gazing on her, the most afflicted of all creatures, what can I not do? And I came away from her filled with new strength, new resolution. While be <laughs> this beginning quote of the article may seem to be like a cruel way to think of someone, the rest of the article humanizes the student of the Institute in a way that most articles in the late 1800s would have never thought to do. That's good. Like, yeah, definitely step in the right direction. Yeah. I think, like, for me, just that, like, if she can accomplish so much, what can I not do? Like, yeah. it, that doesn't, like, it, grate me as much as the the most afflicted of all creatures. Yeah, that's the part where I was, like, the most afflicted. Yeah. Like, that part really grated on me, because I'm like, no, she just has, like, different ways of doing things. But, I mean, like, at that time, they would have think that that is, like a major affliction totally like i mean there there's also like um like we have some like not perfect but we have a great deal of technological tools that can help um screen readers for example things like that where that can help with your day-to-day -day, help you like move through your day-to-day -day in a way that um you know, makes it easier for, makes it easier for you, remove some of those barriers that would have, like, been all over the place before. So, like, like, it, it's, pos I, I, I'm debating in my head whether or not it had, like, more of an impact back then, because we are so techno, technology-based now, like, there's things like hearing aids that didn't exist. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, like, stuff like that so like if we have more tools we have more technology for like helping people move through the world so like i i could understand that it used to be like a bigger like that the world wasn't built for like people with processing disorders or with like things like that well just any so, disabilities like right and even like, now I'm, like we I'm, have it but it's not perfect even now yeah. like i'll be in like the same shopping mall where there's like mm -hmm. uh indigo on one corner and then, like, yeah. kitty corner to it is a cafe. The indigo yeah. has the accessible buttons. Yeah. The cafe the across cafe the street doesn't. has heavy doors and does not have the accessible buttons. I'm like, this is the same mall built at the same time. Yeah. And it's this like, is built why? as a cafe. Why would the hell would you not put an accessible button? And we can't, like, yeah. No, like the inconsistency like we we still have such a long way to go i'm not saying that it's perfect i'm just i'm i'm trying to like yeah piece together like if they described it as more of an affliction back then because it was because there were more barriers probably well and then like, like your societal view but it's like the sense of like superiority well if you can do that then i can do so much better yeah and it's like it's so close to being an acknowledgement of privilege, but it just isn't because she doesn't take into consideration the other person here. She's yeah. just like, oh, you have this obstacle. Well, I don't have to deal with that, so I'm fine. And it's like, no, 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 but then it should be your job to, like, help remove the obstacle. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But yeah, because like, this is a time when people saw, like, those with disabilities as, like, a burden to be shut away in institutions yeah. and quote-unquote dealt with. Um, the idea Oof. that they could learn to be contributing members of society was absolutely, like, unheard of, except by, like, the few who saw the potential that was hidden beneath, like, their unique disabilities. Nellie's humanizing take on all the topics that she wrote about is, like, what really sets her apart from many of her male counterparts. She wasn't afraid to speak the truth and fight for equality through the written word. The way that she wrote her articles also made her topics easy to digest as she wrote mm -hmm. them in like a story format rather than a journalistic pyramid that we learn nowadays. 
She also wasn't right. afraid to get gritty herself so she could uncover the real world implications of the topics that she would cover. On top of getting herself put into an asylum for 10 days, Nellie also <laughs> got herself arrested just so she could fi get firsthand experience of how police treated women answered an Respect. ad in order to uncover a laundry swindling scheme like laundry is in like literal like clothing laundry swindling scheme <laughs> what? what i was assuming like laundering money no nope. like, literally it was like okay. a, it was like literally like a laundry service that they used to swindle people as like a front that's like yeah. what um so like a quote from this article I have heard of this swindle for some time, but one day I received the two letters following, and having nothing else to do, I decided to see what the business was like. <laughs> I'm bored. Let's go take down the swindling business. Like, yeah. <laughs> what? Um, and she even went as far as to purchase a baby from the underground baby market, as Eva Hamilton did. Another quote from her, um, from this article, for several days before I bought a baby, I advertised in a number of newspapers for a baby to adopt. I received no reply. Why? Because people who adopt babies for good purposes and in a legitimate way do not expect to buy them. Those people who have babies in the market expect to sell them and they will not give them away. Oh god, that's... Oh, okay. So she's like, hey, I tried to see what kind of response I would get if I said I wanted to adopt a baby, but but because people are making a profit off of babies, people who want to genuinely adopt a child can't. Yeah. Because the market, because the, cause the market, because like, oh, because there's a market for it. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> yep. just the whole concept of buying a baby, just, ugh, it, uh. So it's one of those things that I know it still happens, but it happens in like a different way. And it's not so just like blatant. It's like sneaky and illegal and like not acceptable. And like, it's just, just, I, I oh, oh, baby. So I wanted to read an article of hers in length for this episode. And this is as good as any to read from since it <laughs> relates back to our previous discussion during the Eva Hamilton episode. So buckle up and enjoy this discussion between a baby sales lady and Nellie. And awesome. now you can open up the link. <laughs> Excellent. So this is our theatrical rendition of Nellie Bly buys a baby. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I went first to see Mrs. Dr. DeMeyer, as her sign reads. She lives in a comfortable house in West 48th Street. A neatly dressed maid ushered me into a very homelike and artistic parlor. The floor was softly carpeted, the windows were hung with real lace curtains, and there was some valuable bric-a-brac around, and, a hams and handsome jardinieres with pictures. Large, rolling glass doors shut off from a small room in the rear. When the door opened to admit Madame Demire, two Sky Terriers troubled over each other in their rush to get in first. Madame Demir is a large, fleshy woman with a double chin and dark eyes. She wore a loose wrapper of some thin material that was as white as the spotless cat, which lay snuggled up in the window. Are you Dr. Demir? I asked. Yes, she replied, motioning me to be seated. Did you advertise a baby for sale? Yes, she replied again, smiling still broader. Do you want a baby? Yes. Have you the baby still? Well, you are the eighth person that has called for that baby today, she replied complacently, um, folding her arms across her ampleness. It has gone now to the doctors with a lady who wanted a baby. She wanted a boy, though, and a fair one. She said her doctor could tell how babies will turn out, so she has taken the nurse and the baby to the doctor to see if it will be fair. I am expecting her every moment now with an answer, but there is another woman upstairs who is very anxious for it. She wanted a boy, but this baby, uh, sorry, she wanted a boy, but this girl baby is so beautiful that she will take it if the other woman does not. How old do you want the baby to be? Quite young, I said slowly, for I had not thought much about age. I expected, however, that they, would, they would be at least, sev at le I expected, however, they would at least be several weeks old. Well, this baby was born at 7 o'clock Saturday morning. That is old enough if you're going to pass it off as your own. Are you married? She asked suddenly. 
Is it necessary for me to tell about myself in order to buy a baby? I thought not, I answered evasively. I don't want to know anything about you. I never remember ladies I have business with, she said with a laugh. When I am paid and a child is taken out of here, that is as far as I'm concerned. You look so young that I cannot believe you wanted the baby for yourself. I suppose you never asked where the baby was going or what use was to be made of it, I said stiffly. I don't, she answered quickly. I never tell who its parents are. I never know who takes it. The moment it is born, I send it to my nurse, who does not live here. There it remains until somebody takes it. The children born here are all of aristocratic parentage. I never take common people in. Just now I sent a woman to my nurses for care, but uh, because she did not belong to the class that patronizes me. What did you expect to pay for a baby? I did not know it, as I never bought one, I replied hesitantly. How much do you charge for one? I don't sell babies, she replied. But people are expecting to pay me something. How much are you willing to give? Ten dollars, I said, remembering the price paid for the Robert Ray Hamilton baby. Oh my, no, she said scornfully. I never get less than twenty-five. The woman who has the baby this afternoon said she would give me fifty if she took it. If she does not take it, will you give twenty-five? Hurry, for there is a woman waiting now who is anxious to take it. If it suits, if it suit me, I will give you twenty-five dollars for it. I replied. What the fuck? What the fuck? Right? <laughs> oh, that feels gross. It's if it, it, they they may as well be buying a cat. Like, holy shit, that's yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> so Nellie did not take that baby. She went to multiple people to find a baby, including the exact women that Eva had gone to for the four little girls who were part of her schemes. By the end of the article, she made the purchase of a day-old baby with beautiful blue eyes for her self-imposed budget of $10. What the fuck? Yeah. And so, like, as we saw, like, some of the baby traders had asked for, like, at least $25, making a hefty profit as the purchased baby... Um, the actual baby that she purchased was sold to the trader for one dollar by its mother. Oh my god! Can I? Ooh, I I I can't imagine. I I can't imagine going through nine months of pregnancy, hours of labor, just to sell the human that you created for one dollar. Yeah. What the fuck? Well, and then, like, the baby trader that... And it, the one that she got the baby from was one of the ones... They, I think it was the last one that Eva had gotten the baby from. And so, like, that woman made $9 off of it. $9. $9 for the... $9, the cost of a... The most innocent human life. $9. Yeah. Literally too young to have done anything yet. $9. That's... Ah, yeah. So I Yikes. did try to find out what happened with the baby, um, but I couldn't find any answers. I believe mm -hmm. that Nellie adopted the baby out, like legally adopted the baby out. Yeah. Um, as she is said to have never had any children of her own. She did have adult stepchildren from a marriage, and she had adopted a baby at the very end of her life, not getting to spend much time with her child at all. Mm hmm. Um, so this, and the, so that one was definitely not this baby, because she did adopt a baby, like, through, like, the legal way at the end. Right. Sadly, Nellie passed away January 27th, 1922, from pneumonia, and is buried at the Woodlawn Cemetery in New York. In 1998, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame, um, was one of four women in the Women of Journalism U.S. stamp set in 2004. And in 2021, a statue memorial was placed called The Girl Puzzle on Roosevelt Island. And the statue um, in 2019, I think, is when they put out and did like a contest for who could design the statue and name it. Mm -hmm. And so, right, so The Girl Puzzle um, is basically, it's, it's, it looks like it's um, just like a silhouette kind of a sculpture of her face and her head but then it's got like some pieces kind of like as if like it's being pieced together and then of course the, uh, the title of it is vindictive of her very first published article right 
There is also an annual prize for female journalists called the Nellie Bly Cub Reporter Award, and it's given to journalists who have three years or less experience in the field. Cool. Remember how earlier I had said that I wanted to write a musical based on Nellie Bly at some point? Yeah. Surprisingly, I am not the first to have that dream. <laughs> in 1946, so... a musical called Nellie Bly by Johnny Burke and Jimmy Van Heusen ran for 16 performances on Broadway. If anyone can find the book and lyrics for it, please send it this way as I am desperate to know what parts of her life they decided to cover. I am I'm also desperate... I couldn't find, like, much of anything on it. I'm also desperate for a copy of the 1890 board game, Around the World with Nellie Bly, please, and thank you. I found the names of the songs. Uh, Internet Broadway Database has the names of the songs. I don't think it has the actual music for it, though. Yeah, like, that's what I want, is I want to know, like, what are the lyrics, what, mm -hmm. like, because, like, as we talked about before with, like, Bonnie and Clyde, right? Like, yeah. yes, they, you can do it on their lives, but it may not be truthful. So I'm like, I want to yeah. know, what did you do? How truthful is it? Like, I, like, when I was working on it, like, I printed out the full thing of 10 Days in a Madhouse to scour through it to ensure that I was going to do it justice. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, actually, like, do it properly. Nice. Okay, I'll stop digging into this now and, like, come back and focus. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that's the story of Nellie. There's, there's so much more we could go through. Like, she wrote so many articles, but... These are the points we wanted to talk on today. <laughs> yeah. Time constraints, man. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, fair enough. As you learned with Synanon. Yeah, so Synanon became four pages very quickly, and it got to the point where I was like, all right, I gotta start trimming this down a little bit. I ended up with... Yeah, just, just about four full pages. And then I had to kind of like, all right, now we're getting into like the abuse and stuff. Maybe we could just like shoot this a little bit just by like not going into detail. Because l listen, I've, I found all the details. I found every single detail and I had to decide which ones to leave out. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy task. It's not an easy task. It's not like... And going through and being like, okay, what crosses the line of like, okay, this is too much, but I will, I'll talk about it later. The main source that I had lists like absolutely everything. It's going to be in our sources. I will uh, move it to the top of the list for the sources. So when it's up there, it's just the first thing that you can click on so that it's easy for y'all to find. And it is kind of the definitive source on this subject and it's got everything it's got everything it breaks down all the files it breaks down all the evidence and lays it all out as a story already um so i was just kind of going through that and uh picking like condensing it a little like a lot actually <laughs> condensing it a lot and uh just trying to figure out where the line for like how triggering is too triggering yeah no definitely what comfortable talking about all right so actually what do you know about synanon <laughs> i know that as a cult as we established yeah. earlier, and that there's apparently yeah. teenagers involved, and now yes. apparently also George Lucas has shit to do with it, or at least, like, George used Lucas them for his yeah. <laughs> filming career. As far as I could tell, that was the only connection to George Lucas, so he's not coming up in the rest of the script now. That was just, like, the weird, like, this is kind of an example of the the relationship between Synanon and society at the time. But so, still, yeah. he used them for his gain. <laughs> he doesn't, he had, he had, like, I, I, willing to bet, willing to put money, because they, like, were very intentional about hiding stuff around that point that there's, like, no way he could have known. Because, yeah, like, I, the, the man had other things to do than look into this cult thing. He's just, like, a bunch of guys, with, or a bunch of people with shaved heads that are willing to act? Cool, that's, no more questions. <laughs> All right. Note to any uh, movie producers and people out there ask questions actually there's a movie about synanon and we're gonna get into this in a little bit from the 60s so this one's gonna get dark uh we should just i should stop spoiling it we should just get into it um this one is gonna get dark uh big trigger warning here for child abuse abuse of teenagers drug use violence and neglect uh violence and neglect and animal abuse i draw the so, line at animal abuse <laughs> I don't, I don't go into detail about the, well, I briefly mentioned the animal, animal abuse. It's not 
I'll explain when we get there. Um, oh, Lord. Okay. It's, yeah, there's there's not a lot of it, of the animal abuse. Abuse of humans is, like, the entire thing. Uh, so same deal as usual. I'm not giving details, but when we talk about it specifically, we'll be putting the timestamp in the notes. This portion of the podcast is going to be heavy, so if this subject is going to be damaging to your mental health, take care of yourself first, and we'll see you next time. This entire thing is a potential trigger warning so when it gets real bad we'll give the timestamps. but just be warned this whole thing is going to be dark all right that being said how does a rehab center become a cult well let's introduce you to charles diedrich born in 1913 ohio the tragedy of charles's life began young when his father died in a car crash when charles was four his mother clung to him probably as a trauma response and we start to see the toxic mother-son relationship we often do with serial killers. At four years old, she made him the father figure in the house and put him on a pedestal. So it's kind of like uh, Psycho with like Norman Bates and his mom? Yes. Okay. Psycho vibes. Very much Psycho vibes. His youngest brother died when he was only eight and he carried too much responsibility for that as well. He and his mother, like, he, his brother died of an illness, but he felt like he was responsible because he felt like he was responsible for the whole household because his mother put him in that position. Yeah. So he and his mother remained being far too close until she got married. Charles was 12, and the marriage made him so jealous he turned to alcohol and began acting out at 12. Yikes. Over his mother getting married. That, yeah, okay. Big yikes. Big, 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 big red flag. Like, I can see it for, uh, like, people who are, like, in, like, Germany during, like, at the end of World War II, because, like, my grandpa has stories of how, like, there's no parents to watch them, and so they could do whatever they wanted, and, like, 12 were, like, drinking and smoking cigarettes and stuff like that, because no one was caring. But, like, yeah. in, like, the 60s, in just, like, a normal, probably, like, suburban area... <laughs> Well, this is, yeah, this is the early, like, 19, like, just about going into the 1920s at this point. Oh, okay. Because um, he was, he was born in 1913, so when his dad died, it was 1917, and so, uh, and that's when he was four, and so eight years later would have been 1925. So, like, during the Prohibition, when booze yeah. were flowing because they were illegal. Yeah. Okay, so that makes sense, then, and as to how he got... <laughs> How the fuck did he get his hands on, like, alcohol during the Prohibition as a random-ass 12-year-old? I don't know, but... I like... don't think that, like, the gangsters and stuff running speakeasies cared who got the alcohol as long as but they could pay <laughs> and... Or, like, if somebody was paying for him. I've got no idea, man. I've got no idea. So, yeah. So, obviously, he began acting out. He failed out of school and he started to work, kind of breezing through this rest of this time period until like the 1940s uh he went on to marry twice but mo both marriages ended because of his drinking uh sometime in the 1940s he finally hit his lowest passed out on a kitchen floor uh with someone telling him that he'd die if he didn't go to alcoholics anonymous so he did okay. uh turns out charles was actually a pretty decent speaker and he started going to meetings every day giving speeches for hours a lot of people liked his speeches a lot, and he started to gain a following. Yeah, so that's how you start a cult. <laughs> <laughs> Just go to Alcoholics Anonymous. You'll have yourself a cult in no time. Uh, well, no, like, I'm, aren't I'm, most I'm cult kidding, leaders, kidding, like, I'm... super good with their words? <laughs> yes, yes, that's how, yes, that's how they do the thing. Like, that's how and we like, get this is cult, because that's how we get Hitler. That failed, <laughs> like, right? Like, this is a kid that failed out of school, but somehow he's an eloquent enough speaker to, like, gain a following here. Like, I don't I don't know if it was, like, the realism. I don't, like, I don't know. I, I don't know <laughs> how he pulled this off. He probably could have been so good if he had just had a better upbringing. Um, like, he, like, yeah. yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, if mental health was a thing that anybody cared about back then, he could have been a very different person and he could have made very different changes, but he kind of turned into a monster. So my sympathy for him kind of dies here. Um, yeah. So he, yeah, so he started to gain a following. He quit his job, which he somehow still had, and started living off unemployment and charity of others in order to help alcoholics recover full time. What time Sounds. frame are we in? Uh, at this point, it's the 1940s. So yeah, like it's not going to be surprising that he could keep his job then, because most like, of the men would be on the front. 
Yeah, but like most men would be on the front. So like jobs and stuff are like, we need people. Who cares if you're drunk at work? We need a, yeah, a okay. body, right? Good point. Good point. So yeah, I'm like, I'm not surprised then that he kept his job at that point. That's fair. That makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, uh, quit living off of unemployment charity in order to help alcoholics cover, recover full time. Uh, after volunteering to be a test subject in an LSD experiment, Charles had what he considered to be an epiphany, wherein he came to the understanding or conclusion that there is no difference between good and bad. Good and bad have no definition. They are the same thing. Good is bad. Bad is good. Nothing matters. It was essentially the epiphany that he had. What is it about these cult leaders and drugs and, and LSD? possibly aliens? Um... Right? <laughs> LSD is like such okay. So um, I was uh, listening to a documentary by Illuminati. That's how I first found out about this cult. Um, and uh, on YouTube, she's she does documentaries on or their team does like documentaries on all kinds of subjects. This was one of them. It's a really really good breakdown of everything that happened. She's the one that pointed me to the the Paul Morantz website, which we'll talk about later. Um, and she said she pointed out the same thing. What is with cult leaders in LSD? Why why is it everything fine and then they take LSD and all of a sudden they're a cult leader? How the like what? Well, I mean, like, and what? we even had like churches. LSD. We had churches that were like, using we, LSD in church right? in order to be able to get closer right? to God and Jesus. I'm like, these like, people what are is it us. about LSD that is so culty? Like, I don't. Like, man, I just, I want to see someone do, like, an investigative breakdown of, like, LSD use and the correlation of that to cults and, and like, how, like, I don't, I don't even get it. Like, this is a rehab, like, this whole thing is, like, he's a rehab leader taking LSD well, and, like, using that as a spiritual experience. And like, wasn't, I think LSD was found when a scientist was trying to do something with, like, insulin or something or something like that, and took the and then took and then like as he was like experimenting he took lsd like he accidentally made he accidentally made lsd took it right and had like the weirdest like stuff happening and then kept go and they kept like experimenting <laughs> with it because he was like this is so weird, like interesting and weird and stuff and then that's how lsd was born i think i think it was insulin or something that he was like trying to like make was- like a better medication a better version of it or something yeah. and created lsd by accident maybe we need to do a podcast episode or a podcast episode going into the history of lsd and it's like cult use like i <laughs> it shows up all the time it's like the most like bizarre connection like it's never like they're smoking a joint or just like taking weed it's like no it's lsd every time <laughs> I mean, I'm not surprised because you've got like the hallucination, like, you got like, your hallucinations yeah. and everything, and it's highly addictive. So right. it's not surprising because then you'd be a lot more easy to like, easily agreeable to things, and then you get addicted so, to it, and that's how you're gonna get it is through your cult. <laughs> so here's the interesting thing, though, is that uh, Charles, there's no like there was nothing else that pointed towards him being addicted to LSD and continuing to use it. He had it like for this one experiment and then he didn't use it again after that. Okay. Right. So what he was, I think, I, I think there's evidence for this later, but I think he was always chasing that high afterwards, but he was trying to do it without using drugs. Interesting. Which is where we get into the weird shit later. So, so he has this, what he considers to be an epiphany. He decides that there's no difference between good and bad, good behavior, bad behavior. There's no difference. He starts educating himself by studying in the public library with like, pop psychology materials of the time essentially someone needs to and get so, him a jiminy cricket yeah i mean <laughs> i he must have been so fucking high dude like i um, okay so over time because of this experience because of his like self-study and all this stuff uh he's his speeches evolved from a general religious undertone that was like common in alcoholics anonymous at the time to more psychological and philosophical leanings so a fun fact about Alcoholics Anonymous, they had and still have, as far as I can tell, a rule about specifically helping alcoholics. So if someone has a drug addiction, they refer them somewhere else, saying that the treatment plan for alcoholics is different from what any other kind of addiction would need. Kind of, it's kind of fair. It makes sense. From what they knew at the time, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, um, and I mean, like, I think in society, you're more like, like, you definitely need a lot more help with alcohol because it's everywhere. 
so, so the actually, temptation's they everywhere. Actually, like, there's more people that need help with alcohol, but um, addiction reco- recovery for drug use w- is more intensive, I think, is kind of what they were getting at. Okay, so um, like, I would have thought that alcohol would be more intensive because, like, you've got temptation everywhere. Like, you're going to go out for dinner and people are going to be drinking alcohol around you. You're going to be more tempted, so you need that extra guidance. Right. But consider the effect of withdrawal from, like, heroin versus alcohol. Yeah. Like, it's not, nec- like, it, it, it wasn't understood to the same level. Um, it, there's, like, a whole, like, yeah, it was just, it was treated as a much, like, different, separate sort of thing. So Now I'm curious as to which one is, the, the least time to become sober with, like, because I'm wondering mm-hmm. if, like, drugs, like, once it's, like, once it's, like, it's, it might be easier to get over it once you've gotten through those withdrawals. Like, it's going to be harder to get through it, but possibly right. a shorter timeline than with, like, like alcohol. Like, the quickest to get over. Yeah, like. like withdrawal-wise. Yeah, because I'm, like, with alcohol, like, as I said, like, you got a lot more temptation Just... for alcohol out there yeah. than you do with a lot of the drugs. But the drugs change your brain in a much more drastic way, as far yeah. as I understand. So I'm like, I'm so, curious to see like if there's a difference in like the time it takes to become more sober. Because like, because the thing is though, like, um, society, societally, so, so mm, socially, like socially, that's thank you. <laughs> Like, uh, so, yeah, so the thing is, though, like, socially, like, alcohol is more accepted, it's easier to come by and stuff, but if you're the kind of, like, if you're a person that's already using heroin, it's not hard for you to get heroin anymore. Like, you've already crossed the heart, like, you know how to get it. Yeah. Like, it's not... Or how to make it yourself. Or how to make it yourself, whatever. Like, it's not... Or you get in a car accident, go to the hospital. Specifically. (laughs) I keep using heroin as my example because that was the drug that kept coming up in the in the movie that they made about Synanon, so I don't know why my well, brain keeps think, going to heroin. But I mean, I think like, that's heroin <laughs> is a bit more of a common drug because, I mean, morphine yeah. is basically a diluted heroin. Yeah. So True. it's a lot more common because we do use it medically. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyway, we've gotten off topic a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's related. So, yeah, so they had... Yeah, so it's basically uh, Narcotics Anonymous is, like, the um, drug addiction rehab uh, equivalent to Alcoholics Anonymous. So, like, they would they would refer people elsewhere. Uh, so Charles decided he wanted to branch out, and he left uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and took his following with him. So he originally called the new group the Tender Loving Care Club, but their tactics were anything but. They played a game where anyone was allowed to say anything true or false to get the other person to react. So basically an organized bullying circle and they called it the game. Dear Lord. Okay. Yeah. Not good reactions. No, like to get someone to like yell and like feel intense emotions. Um, The only thing that was not allowed in this game was the threat of violence uh, and secrets were discouraged. Um, okay, well, that's it was a bit a of a plus. Of... Sorry? That's just, like, a little bit of a plus. <laughs> it's, 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 at this point, yeah. <laughs> like, at <laughs> least, we're not, like, don't do violence, don't do, like, try not to do any secrets. Like, don't out somebody. <laughs> but that's, no, but secrets, that would, that would have been outing somebody. Like, they would have been pushing and pushing and pushing until someone confessed to oh, whatever God. they wanted them to confess to. That's what they mean by secrets. They mean you're not allowed to have any privacy whatsoever. Yep, it's a cult. And it's not a safe place. Like, this is the start of it. It hasn't even gotten into the culty shit yet. This is, like, this is baby steps. This is step one. So, basically, this was a form of attack therapy that ended up being mimicked by multiple other rehabs, military schools, and group therapies, and cults before people woke up and realized that maybe it's the healthiest plan. Maybe maybe shaming people into admitting that their, like, behaviors are, like, a problem in their lives is not the best way to help them heal and get over it. Um, no, really? Really? Like, usually when someone has, like, turns to an addiction or a coping mechanism that's toxic or unhealthy to them, usually there's a underlying trauma or something that happened that makes them feel the urge to self-medicate and numb themselves. Usually, shaming people who are already traumatized isn't the best way to get them towards healing. It's like, uh, yeah, like, it's, we know better now. Some people still do this, but we 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 do we know better now. 
Um, on a whole, we know better. There's just a few whole, outliers. The information <laughs> exists, at least. The information exists now. Whether or not people choose to understand it is a different thing. So, yeah. So when drug addicts started joining the group, specifically the alcoholics from Alcoholics Anonymous, objected. Uh, but Charles chose the new recruits over his previous followers. My this and basically told the AA guys to kind of like go fuck themselves. Um, like told them that they could leave. Well, like as we said, like the people who have a drug addiction are probably easier to control. Yeah. So I mean, I'm not absolutely. surprised that he would pick them. Like really, he chose the more the more vulnerable group, the ones that like couldn't fight back. Yeah. As much, right? So by this point, they were living in a storefront, uh, just like a random like storefront shop, uh, surviving by begging and hanging a hose through a window to use as a shower. Jesus. Yeah, they, it's not great living conditions. They have no, they have no funding. Like they're not doing anything like for like they're living off of charity and people's like generosity. So now it's uh, 1958. This like this whole process took quite some time. Uh, going from being an AA member to a leader to uh, branching out to the group changing and evolving like, took quite a bit of time. So 1958, Charles changed the name from the Tender Tender Loving Care Club to Synanon, which was apparently a combination of the words symposium and seminar after one of the members slurred them together. I don't know. I don't know. The look on your face is telling me everything I need to know. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know how you get Synanon from symposium and seminar. I'm more shocked know. at like the original name. Right? The Tender Loving Care Club at least sounds cozy. Synanon is just like... Like, Synanon like, sounds is, like is... a cult. It's like Synanon and Nexium. <laughs> right? Like, it's just... <sighs> Nothing against the actual medication Nexium that is for... Um, but the cult like, after, like acid sure. reflux. Well, the cult is like... It's like N-X-I-U-M or something like... It's like a very weird. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Like, like, it's I'm like, like how do you get nexium like out of this? <laughs> looks like they took a bunch of Roman numerals and we're like, how do we pronounce this? And just went with it. <laughs> yeah. So this is where we start seeing Charles slowly implement more and more cult tactics. Members had their past lives attacked in the game. We're told that they had to stay in the group in order to have a future. They were forbidden from contacting family members. Um, told that their a lot of their problems arose because they still loved their mothers. What? Yeah, I don't know. I remember Charles' relationship with his mother is an interesting one to base a lifestyle off of. So, and, and eventually, uh, systematic rewards and punishments were implemented as well. Yeah. So, for example, in order to punish and make an example out of someone from bad behavior, the member was forced to shave their head. Man or woman didn't matter. You act out, no hair for you, and everyone knows that you messed up. It was like a, a form of public shaming and it was a brainwashing technique disguised as rehab. Addicts were also cut off cold turkey with no medical help and Synanon even prided themselves in being a doctor-free self-help facility. No. Which was not legal at the time. No, you need a doctor. Don't trust the man who figured everything out off of not. LSD. <laughs> Literally, like, he... Uh, self-taught from some random public library like no like i love public libraries we're we're we're, we're not we the, the materials that we provide are not enough to like give you your doctorate like no it's, you're not the studying at the library is great for benefiting your own life it does not make you a doctor well um, like depending on the library you don't I, always, you don't usually library. get textbooks in a library yes. that are actually written by people who know what they're talking about you have, yes. like, a lot of your books are, like... Self-help books. Well, self-help books, or books that are written, like, for or a more public consumption than yes. a textbook is. So you're not for getting example, all the information. <laughs> for example, my local public library has textbooks for nursing students as, like, uh, exam prep and stuff. Um, reading one does not make you a nurse. No. It just helps right? you prep like, for your exam with the extra knowledge you're getting through the university exactly exactly, exactly. It, it does not give you enough information to like be able to run a facility like this and this is just like cruel and neglect don't we like, also have like the firefighters and like the police 
I think we also have like the firefighter and yes. police ones in our library, right? Where it's like, it's not going to give you the actual, here's how to use a gun and how to use it properly. <laughs> and exactly. how to actually run into a building to save exactly. the fire. <laughs> you don't just spray the hose willy nilly. <laughs> right. Like, no, exactly. Reading, reading a textbook is not the same as studying, like, like there's so much more information. Like, I just, like, I, mm, yeah, no, it just, it, it drives, it, it, it pisses me off with when um, people go around, like, acting like doctors when they're not. Um, and this is, like, the worst. Like, this is literally just abuse by neglect at this point because these poor people were coming off cold turkey which is very much not recommended with oh, like no. no medical help no painkillers no nothing no nothing like they were just like kind of left to like like fed and housed sure but they were just doing it on their own essentially like it's well and, like we saw so... that with like johnny depp like during the johnny depp trial and then when they talked mm -hmm. about his drug and alcohol rehab and stuff right mm -hmm. and like the shit he went through during that and he didn't yeah. and he still didn't have like a good like an actual like doctor doctor mm -hmm. he had just someone that they had paid yeah to help him through yeah. that like that is like i can't imagine for these people what they friggin went through i know it's just like that alone is already like oof, maybe we don't do that I mean, he was so proud of it, and he thought that he was doing, like, groundbreaking stuff by not having a doctor involved. Like, he really tried to pass it off that way. Yeah, and, and the other thing as well is that, as a result of this, the only person that these members had to go to for help was Charles, which puts them in this crazy position of power. Like, Charles, and again, like, failed out of school, completely self-taught. Like, it's it puts him in this crazy position of power, and it's completely undeserved. Like, it's... Uh, he He is not enough to help an addict into recovery. Like, it's enough to brainwash them into recovery, maybe, but not enough to actually help them heal. So, like, it's just, like, uh, ah, it's infuriating. And so infuriating. Yeah, um, and especially when you have someone by the name of Charles running a cult. We all know what happens <laughs> with Charles's and cults. Oh my God. So we have some, some fun little quirky quotes from Charles uh, from around this time period. Uh, he is quoted as saying that, quote, freedom to think to a dope addict is like a gun to a baby. The so hell? So basically, addicts just didn't, shouldn't have, like, freedom of thought because they're just going to kill themselves with it. And he is said to have coined the phrase, today is the first day of the rest of your life. That was him. So the next time you see that in a flowery Instagram or Pinterest post, just remember that was originally said by a cult leader. Or, like, at least allegedly... Allegedly, bursted, but like he, Jesus Christ, he claims it. He claims it, and yeah, but I think he'd claim you know, anything for attention. This guy, like poss possibly, I didn't see anything suggesting that it like that he was wrong. I like okay, the Palmer Ants website would have absolutely scathed him about it if he had found like found it important to point out that he was wrong. Um, so yeah, so he coined it. That doesn't mean he's the first person ever to have said it, but he uh, he claims. Um, yeah, he, he kind of claims responsibility for turning it into a popular phrase. Great. Yeah. So, that's fun. He also started preaching act as if, which meant stop thinking for yourself and just act as if everything I say is true and logical, which he defended by teaching members that their own logic and thought process is how they became addicts in the first place, so they can't trust their own minds. But they, but he wants them to trust him, who is also yes. an addict. Yes. Who yeah. technically, according to him, shouldn't be able to trust himself. Yes, because he had an epiphany on LSD. Oh, fucking Christ. Okay. <laughs> I know. I know. I see it. I hear it. I know. Believe me, I know. So the group somehow kept growing. People kept volunteering for this, and Charles moved in everyone into an empty National Guard building in Santa Monica. Uh, neighbors complained as they were concerned that a rehab facility would attract active addicts from other areas to Santa Monica and, like, lower the property value of their homes, essentially, which is, like, kind of a garbage take, but, like... But, like, I think that's what he's he planning. Was running it was garbage, so it was worth investigating. But I think that's also what he was, like, hoping for, was yes, to bring was in goal, more people. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was his goal. So that's literally exactly what he wanted to do. Um, which is not to say that, like addiction recovery like facilities shouldn't be bringing addicts 
like from wherever uh, to help them and heal them. But the way that he was running it was was like definitely worth investigating. So, child, like you know, like addiction recovery facilities, they need to exist and they need to exist somewhere. So an abandoned National Guard building is is as good as any. But my problem was with how he was running it. Yeah. So uh, Charles was uh, investigated and he was arrested for operating without a health license and out of zone. He wasn't allowed to be operating at all and he wasn't allowed to be operating in that area. He was convicted and given a choice between moving his operation as a condition of probation or I know like he was allowed to continue just not there or going to jail. He manipulated the situation and turned himself into a martyr, choosing choosing jail time and framing it as his way of suffering for the cause. The hell? He didn't have... I will reiterate, he did not have to go to jail. He could have just moved his operation, but he chose jail time in order to, like, turn himself into a martyr in the public eye. First of all, don't give him a <laughs> fucking choice. <laughs> Be like, you're moving I... it, and here's some jail time. Mm-hmm. Don't yeah, give him you a choice, it. and maybe I don't know. Look at the fact that he has no actual like qualifications to be doing this, and be like, you can't have this at all. I kind of wonder if they thought that they were avoiding the martyrdom by giving him a choice, but then he chose to be a martyr. No, this so guy's too like, smart. I feel like if that was the case, it kind of backfired. Like, no offense, like, you really to... can't claim to be a martyr if you're choosing like the persecution you know what i mean like he literally was like yeah no okay that like but like no offense to like people who are like g- like wholesome society wise geniuses that are actually mm-hmm. doing things for good yeah but the p- crazy person <laughs> running these things is also amazingly smart and they're I going to how. have a plan <laughs> i like i i he must have been like yeah i don't he was a master manipulator. That's that's for sure. Or yes, he was that really, is a really very big lucky. type of intelligence. <laughs> Manipulation is an intelligence role. Yeah, that's true. Like you do. It's have not to charisma. It's intelligence, people, which is uh, yeah, an unfortunate fact of life. Um, so yeah, but yeah, so he was framing this as his way of suffering for the cause. He can't suffer enough to do right by his members and go to medical school, but will apparently choose jail, which he didn't have to do. He literally could have just picked a different area to operate out of. Like, there's no way around it. Like, he is making his own suffering here. But his strategy worked. Uh, and he started raking in donations from wealthy celebrities as his story spread. Um, he really did frame it as, I'm just trying to help these poor addicts. And they want me to go to jail because I'm trying to help people. And people bought it. They bought it hook, line, and sinker. Jesus. Like it. No, 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 no. So, yeah, so he starts raking in the big bucks. Uh, It was such a big story that he became perceived as a public hero, and Governor Edmund Brown signed a bill exempting Synanon specifically from health licensing laws, basically telling Charles that he can do whatever he wants. No! In 1965, Columbia Pictures even produced a movie based on the, quote, rehab facility called Synanon. The trailer and the full movie are both on YouTube and listed in the sources. No. It is wild. I, I started by watching the trailer and then I was like, this is this is insane. Like, this is some crazy stuff. And then um, I did. I watched the whole movie and I will say, if you want to check it out, it's interesting. But proceed with caution. They do show drug use on screen as well as an overdose. Okay. And did this mm-hmm. cult also have like celebrities as part of the cult by any chance because this is sounding a lot like nexium with like how like they used celebrities and like hollywood in order Mm -hmm. to gain followers so it did say in my sources that there was like a name celebrities who backed it by like funding it and giving them donations during this time it did not name any celebrities who were members but it did say that some of the members were wealthy so (sighs) <sighs> possibly question mark i would love to but, know yeah. like yeah so proceed with caution uh it seems to have been filmed on the ori- on the original santa monica property though which is kind of interesting to see like the building that they lived in and it's really enlightening as far as like the public perception um 
of what Spin and On was, like it really couldn't have been more clear than in this film. Like this film describes exactly what everyone thought was going on in Spin and On. And it's, it's really interesting just to look at it from that perspective. It even talks about uh, Charles going to jail and him agonizing over the decision do I oh they want us to move the they want us to move the rehab center they probably want us to se- uh, want to send us off to Alaska so they don't have to deal with us anymore we we Poor deserve Alaska. better than this yeah that's what they said in the film like, I don't know if that was actually where they wanted them to go, but they but still said, poor Alaska. Well, there was like literally, it's like a line in the film where the one guy asks Charles, um, like, "Well, where do they want us to go?" And he's like, "I don't know, probably Alaska or something. They don't want to deal with us, so that they never have to hear from us again." And just because it's so like far north and remote, like, well, I, like I think that still has but like also, underlining racism to it as well. Because Alaska is a very high indigenous there. population. Yeah. Especially, like, I, I think I, at that time. So, like, and, like, yeah. we all know that because of what we have done as yeah. Caucasian people in history, there's a lot of drug and alcohol abuse in Alaska. They didn't mention or, like, the in the indigenous Alaska at all so i think the connection was like i like there is some underlying racism but i think it more so comes from the assumption that alaska is this barren wasteland and nobody lives there um i that's kind of more so how they were talking about it like i don't think they were talking about people from alaska joining the rehab center i think it was like yeah yeah but like it's nowadays when you watch it like that's definitely gonna be yeah. like one of the first things where it's like oh, oh fuck <laughs> <laughs> it's filmed in the 60s. There were quite a few moments where I was like, oh my god. Like, yeah. It, yeah. It is, like I said, it's wild. It's a little interesting as far as like understanding public perception to what Sinanon was at the time and like seeing the property and stuff. It was interesting for that. But like, a huge proceed with caution. Yeah. It's the, it's the kind of movie to drink to and shake your head at. Like, it's, uh, yeah. it's something. So, yeah. Uh, so Senanon, from this experience, was left with a lot of money and an inflated ego and set to work building and expanding all the while brainwashing its members. So to the dismay of the city of Santa Monica, uh, they bought a beachside hotel in 1967 as a part of this expansion. Unfortunately, Santa Monica mishandled the situation. Uh, they claimed that they owned the beachfront when they didn't and then started destroying their property. Okay. That they did not own. So all, and this, like, was a really shit, like, it was just a really bad move on their part. Because all Charles had to do was stand in front of a mic and tell the world that they stepped out of line. And he immediately had everyone backing him again. Oh, dear lord. Yeah, so they genuinely mishandled the situation. And he actually had a leg to stand on here. Because they destroyed his stuff that was his. And so everybody backed him again. He threatened a lawsuit and the city backed down immediately. And this just reinforced to him that Sinanon was invincible. They could do no wrong and no one could stop them. So oh, Charles darn. gets braver. All right. So here we have the content warning for the sentimental mothers in the crowd. Sue, I'm talking to you. We're talking about <laughs> child neglect here. <laughs> Charles started preaching that children were a burden on the enlightenment of their parents. Uh, he portioned off a part of the facility and called it the hatchery. Babies were taken from their parents and left there to be raised by a few rather than the whole group. If a mom wanted to see her children too much, they'd call her a head sucker. Children were raised communally, communally in Sinanon school, where they learned Sindo, which was a variation of karate specific to Sinanon, uh, partner swapping, which was a uh, established practice among the adults at this point. So, like changing up partners every now and then, just so you don't get too attached to one person. Oh lord. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, you're not allowed to have a connection with anybody except for Charles. And the kids would also write essays about Charles Diedrich and uh, all the rules that he had laid out and everything and fighting the holy war, as he, as they called it. So at this point, they went from outsiders being allowed to watch and even participate in the game to being more and more closed off, disallowing members to have any contact with the outside world rather than just their families at this point. So they no longer were being rehabilitated with the intent of having a better future, as they claimed before, but they were clearly only being trained as recruits for Synanon with the goal of having them stay forever. Uh, people who wanted to leave beyond this point, like, I think earlier, but then, like, it was more and more established um, 
at this point that people who wanted to leave were called splitters and they were shamed for wanting to, you know, graduate from rehab. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Uh, so he designed a program that would emotionally break down an individual before invoking a mass group euphoria for the whole crew, uh, leaving members especially vulnerable to re-education and conformity. I didn't want to go into the details of this process because it is a lot. It's a lot of emotional abuse and psychological abuse uh but there's one part of this that was just really weird and i just wanted to like talk about this one part because it's odd so one of the things that was a part of this process which took like a whole weekend what that charles did to these people was um he threatened them through a ouija board so after being forced into exhaustion like i said it takes like a whole weekend the witching hour would start and two women in black robes would use a Ouija board to give the members pre-scripted messages from Charles, misinterpreting Emerson quotes and threatening that if they didn't conform with the Synanon family, they'd be damned to Dante's fifth circle of hell. Oh, Lord. And the people that were like experiencing this were being told that these were messages from the afterlife. Okay. Yeah. So... Interestingly enough, uh, the fifth circle of hell was where the wrathful and the sullen went to be punished, with the wrathful fighting each other for eternity and the sullen sinking beneath the river sticks. Yeah. So, like, from a cult that uses the game to force big wrathful emotions out of people, it was an interesting choice to say specifically the fifth. Well, I think because they're like, see, you are wrathful, therefore this is where you will go exactly exactly it hits a little too close to home i think that's the intent i don't know if that always came through but i think that was the intent i'm sure it would have been made clear so sleep deprivation was the main tactic in these things and charles later said that if you well it was the main underlying tactic there was a lot that was happening on top of it and getting piled on top of it but sleep deprivation was like kind of this staple and charles later said that if you kept people up long enough you can make them believe anything yeah which like he was cruel but he wasn't wrong no, like, it um, totally is something yeah. that we know for sure that oh, sleep deprivation exactly. makes you a little loopy. Well, exactly. It's classified as a form of torture to, like, ref like refuse to allow someone to sleep. Like, that's, yeah. like, it, it will mess you up bad. Uh, so in the 70s, uh, Synanon escalates again. And now they started taking in troubled teens. Uh, who were being sent by the courts as an alternative to any other military school or juvenile detention centers. So this is where the teen abuse comes in. So yeah, trigger warning here for that. For the first time, Synanon dropped their pacifist, quote pacifist, physically pacifist, no violence rule. Yeah, I'm going to do my best to avoid specifics, but all of this is going to be rough. So buckle up or tap out if you need to. <laughs> These kids none of them wanted to be there none of them chose it so the usual nonviolent methods failed you had to be a willing participant at the start in order for the game to work effectively right yeah so the way that synanon chose to work around this was they would physically attack the teens before they would verbally attack them like their adult counterparts once that line was crossed there was no going back they started using it as punishment for just members, for everybody. Members started wearing uniforms and shaving your head was no longer a punishment. It wasn't intense enough, I guess, uh, but instead it was a symbol of commitment. Um, they were also called out for running a medical clinic that they had no qualifications or business running. Uh, authorities were looking into them again because of that and telling them that they were going to have to start paying taxes because they had a medical clinic that was a business and not a charity now, right? Yeah. So... Charles did what any upstanding citizen would do. He declared their organization a religion. The and Church like, of Synanon. I'm like, making isn't that tax kind of exempt. Like the main thing for cults is that at some point they become a religion so that they don't have to pay freaking taxes. Literally, it's just for taxes. Like, I... It's, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So he declared himself a god. And his first decree was that there should be no more children in the community because they were a distraction. So men were forced into having vasectomies and at least four women were pushed into having abortions. No, 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 no. Yeah, big no, 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 no. Um, Charles's third wife, because yes, he had remarried at some point during this and he was now married at this point, uh, died around this time. 
And so he also decreed couples had to break up every three years and switch partners like a square dance to avoid emotional heartbreak uh, of unexpected loss. So they were already partner swapping before. Now it was like, here's your time formal. frame. You have to do it by this time. Yes. It's like Leonardo yes. Don't DiCaprio. get too close because in three years you're over. It's like Leo and his twenty five age twenty five rule. Like, <laughs> but that's self imposed though. Like that's different. Eh. Ugh, that's gross. That's gross. It's still too, like that's... a very awkward rule. Allegedly, allegedly, for the, for for the sake of the lawyers, allegedly, um, it's gross. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. It's not a good look. Yeah, so they continued in their kind of path of aggression of like physical aggression and they started uh training up like members were starting to be trained up as a marine corps in what they called her majesty's imperial marines so do not bring the lovely queen's name into this oh no 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 they weren't referring to the queen i think they were referring to charles's wife i'm pretty sure she was her majesty's imperial marines yeah but she's gonna be gone sure within like three wife. years well, no, he had been married for longer than three years. So why does but, he get to be married for died, longer than three years? And then he, sorry. So then why does he get to be married longer than three years when everybody else is not allowed to? He's literally quoted as saying that he doesn't have to follow the rules because he made them. I'm like that is not how <laughs> it works, man. He classified himself a god, and you're hung up over how long he got married. <laughs> like he, yeah, no, that was why he made the three-year rule was because he was married for longer than three years. So in order to avoid heartbreak of unexpected loss, he's like, now you just have to expect it because every three years it's going to happen. So you don't get to get too close and like deal with heartbreak anymore. Uh, I don't like this guy. Okay. Right. It, it only gets worse. So, so yeah. So adults, teens, he was training people up to be a part of his army and like their organization was like huge at this point like hundreds of members multiple locations across the states like they got like they were big so them building up an army coming from this perspective like that's concerning and like yeah like it was just it was it was concerning and it started to like get yeah it, 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 we're getting close to the start of the downfall here we're not quite there yet but we're getting there so the kids of Synanon, because remember, there are kids in this group, they started getting brave too. And they started running away, which, yeah, a lot of them did get out. A neighbor named Alvin Gambon, uh, no, I'm going to take a second and re-say that so that I can pronounce it properly on the first try. A neighbor named Alvin Gambonini helped them get out and reconnect with their families. And he was a hero for this considering the turn that they had taken he was genuinely putting his own health and safety on the line here and the fact that he could get these kids and like a, a lot of them he got a bunch of kids out and got them back to their families and that was like he was amazing for this um but Sinanon found out and they beat him he 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 was injured from the looks of things he survived uh i didn't see any connection to any successful murders um okay. with Sinanon. But they were, they were like, yeah, but they did beat him. And now the violence had spread outside, outside of the walls of the cult. Another line has been crossed, and they're not coming back from it. Okay, I like that this guy got these kids out. Mm -hmm. But did he not go to the police who are already investigating these people to be like, hey, here's what's happening. Here's like witnesses that have, that we've just gotten out of this thing. I don't get know somebody undercover that, and get in there like I don't know that there's much that they could have done at this point like they already won against against the city of Santa Monica on multiple occasions they've already been told like legally unless you have evidence of this happening that's why I said get somebody undercover but, but like this is also like this is the six or this is the 70s like no the, the police wouldn't have been listening to the kids he could have tried to convince the police to go undercover, but he's just some random guy. He just yeah. happens to live next door. Like, he could have tried to call it in, but without being able to present anything to the police that they would actually care about, I like, I don't know that they would have done much of anything anyway. We are getting close to the end here, though. So he, yeah, I, I from my perspective, he did what he could do, and what he could do was practically get the boys out. Yeah. Um, there was probably also worry about, like, backlash. Um like if the police start 
poking their nose in, the first thing that they're going to do is knock on the doors and say, hey, is anything like underhanded going on here and then the guy they'd just be like no it's it's totally fine and they'd be like all right peace you know like it like you had to dig deep in order to get to the stuff when you first walked in the doors it didn't necessarily immediately jump out at you that people were being abused here yeah um and the same thing kind of happens with like families of abuse where uh you know the child that comes up and speaks speaks out about it um often ends up being punished by the abuser once the abuser realizes that they're being questioned there's no undercover investigation it's not uh, like it's it's a it's a massive risk it's a massive risk to the people who are already being victimized and like i understand the caution about not wanting to put someone through that through yeah. the repercussions so yeah but like i said so now the violence had spread outside the walls of the cult they crossed that line and they were talking more than ever about attacking opposers uh and across their multiple locations across the country synanon mobs started attacking young people who got too close to the property so they were just outwardly being violent at this point finally their down downfall met the horizon when they took a woman in a pre-psychotic break into their facility and refused to release her to her husband oh, Lord. the husband hired our hero paul morantz who wrote the comprehensive masterwork on synanon that most of the script is based on i've mentioned this a couple times now this is the guy He's a journalist, an attorney, and an expert on cults and especially uh, brainwashing tactics used by them. He led the charge against Synanon in a massive way, pushed a grand jury to action, and began the fight to end Synanon. After a long legal battle, he started claiming victory after victory, returning kids to their homes and driving Synanon to bankruptcy because it was lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit that they kept losing. This guy knew what he was doing and he was damn good at it. Synanon fought back by trapping a rattlesnake in Marantz's mailbox. They were trying to have him murdered. And they were trying to make it look like they were unaffiliated with it. I, that's, like, the most suspicious thing I ever could have thought of, though. So I don't really, like, I don't live in a place where rattlesnakes, like, live naturally. So I don't know if it's normal for rattlesnakes to climb into mailboxes. But that I was their chosen so. tactic. Also, that we one so, pissed off rattlesnake yeah. to the people well, who were trying worse. to stuff it into a box. <laughs> The rattle had been removed from the snake so that it could attack without being discovered. Yeah. So that's where the animal abuse comes in because Synanon is the one that did that. And none of them are doctors and none of them know it. They're, like, I can't assume that any of them are vets. So I can't assume that it was done safely or like in a way that didn't harm the snake. So this is a pissed off snake. This is an injured snake. It has no rattle, so there's no warning. So what does it do as soon as he opens the mailbox? It, it like, it, you know, yeah, like it, it lunges. attacks. Yeah. It defends itself. And so, hang on though. Morantz. That is a very risky place to, like, I feel yes. so bad for the snake, but it's a risky place to put yeah. the snake because you don't yes. know that your vict intended victim is going to be the one to yes. open the mailbox. It could be the yes. mail person putting the mail in yes. the mailbox. <laughs> right? Like, they, they would have been fine if it was anyone from Morantz's family because he had a wife and kids too, right? Like, he, like, I think he had kids. He definitely had a wife. Um, but still, you gotta so have the mailman put the mail in the mailbox. I know. I know that, and you know that, but these people are insane. So, that's actually, you know what? That's not fair to people who actually have, like, mental illnesses. Like, these people are just evil. They're just evil. This insanity isn't even, like, the right word for that. They're just evil. Unfortunately, Morantz was the one to, well, fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know, because he did end up surviving it. It's, like, I guess better to him than a, co than a kid? I don't know. But, like, ugh. But Morantz was the one to open the mailbox. The snake bit him. Uh, the paramedics came quickly. They helped. They they had to kill the snake because, like, the, the, the snake is, like, you know, attacking people and trying to kill people. Well, and um, it had no rattle to warn people that it was there right? to like, attack. The snake like, wasn't... The People snake had no chance have a good against shot the of snake. Living yeah. a ha happy, healthy life anyway. So, yeah, snake ended up being killed. Morantz was rushed to the hospital and was stuck there for 11 days, but he survived. And the Synanon Marines involved were arrested. Finally. They had also. They had also been threatening uh, other people in connection to Marantz as well. And so uh, they were arrested. Like, that was, like, added on to everything, too. So, uh, they were involved, they were arrested. So their boss, Charles, our brave hero for the, for the addicts in the, in the community, uh, got up and fled to Europe in order to escape arrest. 
he didn't last long out there because he started drinking. Uh, I guess he couldn't handle the wine culture. <laughs> and and he passed out uh, and was arrested while he was passed out uh, for attempted murder for giving the order to have Morantz killed. So many of Synanon's imprisoned members during this time tried to paint themselves as martyrs, uh, but that's pretty tough to claim when more and more convictions for murder are being handed out to your cult. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, that's kind of... As much as I don't like the guy, that's a bit of an embarrassing story to have to tell. That, yeah, I was arrested right. for running... Like, because I was running this rehab center cult thing, <laughs> and I was arrested while passed out drunk. Yes. Yeah, again, the rules don't apply to him. He just makes them up. No, I know, but like that is like, I could just see all <laughs> like, the other I inmates know. basically being like, the hell, yeah. dude, we're taking you out right now. Thank you. <laughs> like, literally, like, alcoholism is like what started him on this whole path of just turning into this evil, horrific monster. It's kind of like, story wise, it's almost poetic that it ends up being his downfall. Yeah. Like, it's just like, it's it's almost just poetic justice. Like, it's like, yeah, of course the drink would take you out at the end here. So, yeah, so the group started, like, tried to claim, oh, they're putting us to jail because of we're trying to help people, and they tried to do the whole martyr thing that had gotten them off before. Uh, but this time, it didn't work. Uh, murder is a little bit of a different story. People don't see you the same way after you've tried to kill people. Yeah. Shockingly enough. <laughs> so, and not to mention the overwhelming amount of evidence and tapes and tapes and tapes of Charles admitting and more so bragging about everything that he'd done that came out. All thanks to our friend Morantz. So he pleaded no contest to the charges of conspiracy to commit murder and was given a plea deal. So instead of jail time, he did not go to jail for this one, instead of jail time, because he chose no jail, uh, all he had to do was step down as chairman to Synanon and stay the fuck away from it. Excuse instead me? Instead of going to jail. For trying to murder someone. No. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. That yeah. is not Free okay. Free man. I do not Living condone. his life. And, like, he tried, but Synanon wouldn't let him back in. So the head was finally cut off from the... Bo and the body soon crumpled. A tax assessment... This is hilarious that it comes down to a tax assessment. But a tax assessment that came from this investigation led to most, if not all, of the properties being confiscated or sold. And by 1991, Synanon was finally gone. Was it? Mostly. I'm like, or are there still people who are like followers now? Well, uh, would you believe me if I told you that they still have a branch in Berlin? Kind After of, After yeah. operating exclusively out of the United States, I don't understand how the fuck it's there. Well, probably, like, um, one of, like, the people, like, one of the OGs moved to Berlin and just kind of restarted it. All I can think about is that Charles escaped to Europe to to try to run away from his convictions. And I wonder if someone there was inspired by him. I don't know. I have no possible. idea. I just know that they have a website and they they have their head office listed as being in berlin there's like uh an english version of the website that you can download as a pdf um so i couldn't like scour through the whole thing but i could gather that much and it it is a rehabilitation center and it looks like it's very much what synanon was trying to be i have no idea if this uh if this organization like has like, any real connection to it whatsoever, any real connection to one of the OGs, I don't know. I do know that Charles died in 1997, uh, so I'm not worried about him or his lackeys. But I would maybe, I, I, from my preliminary searches, I would maybe steer clear of it just in case. So, there is so much more that you could dig into with this one, uh, but to avoid some of the more painful stuff, this is the synopsis that we get. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I said in the beginning, uh, check out the sources for more information. Like I said, Paul Morantz is the real MVP here, and his website gives a painfully thorough breakdown of everything. Every document, year by year, exposing the whole thing so that the truth about what happened in Sinanon's legacy is not some watered-down misrepresentation like the movie or the books that were written about it. 
so definitely check it out. He even says there's a page on his website where uh, there was an author who was writing a book about it, and he reached out to him and said, hey, I'm the guy that's involved in all of this. I have all the documents. I have all the research. I have all the results. Like, I have everything. Do you want this? And the response that he got from the author was, my clo- my book is too close to being published. If anything that you give me is, like, uh, doesn't line up with what's in the book, then I don't want to have to, like, I don't want to have to change it this close to publication. No, no, no. Yeah, right? So he clearly wasn't bothered by whether or not it was actually accurate. Uh, Morantz goes on about this. He's pretty salty about it from the sounds of things, which honestly, fair. Yeah. Um, so that's what he says was his inspiration for putting everything up on his website. Uh, it is, uh, it's literally just paulmorantz.com. And then he's got information about a bunch of different things. And a good chunk of it is about Sinanon. So if you want more information, if you want to dig into more of this, uh, then go check that out there. That is the, the, the breakdown or like kind of the story of Sinanon is like the first uh, link in my portion of the sources. So yeah, Sinanon. Sadly, like I'm not it's a lot. surprised that it happened just knowing like all the other cults and things and stuff like the yeah do these things i'm like it's not surprising and that's sad it's not surprising it is disappointing uh and it's like i can't imagine the trauma that these kids went through the ones that were born into synonym the amount of like unlearning that they had to do in order to be able to function in society it, yeah. like uh, I, I really, really feel for them. I really, really feel for the parents that never got to raise their kids because of this. I really, really feel for the couples, the families that were broken up, the teens that were, like, put through so much more than they should have been. Like, these these kids, like, were in such, like, a vulnerable position, and they needed help, and they needed support, and what they got was just flat-out abuse, and that's, like, just indescribably wrong yeah and like i just i i feel so much for the victims of the brainwashing and the victims of this cult and like yeah charles is just one of those situations where it's like okay we like i'm as life goes on i'm more and more convinced everybody has bad stuff in their past right it's what we choose to do with it that kind of defines us and makes us who we are charles chose to become a monster yeah like to some extent like there are definitely places along this way along the way where he chose reaching for power over human empathy um and basic human decency like i i am a strong believer that you should always treat everybody um as if you don't know what's going on in their life because you don't and like granting patience and extra empathy and like just treating people like they've been through more than you suspect because they probably have yeah. Um, but like, yeah, you can't, you just, you can't let yourself just like take the bad stuff from your past and just inflict it on other people. Like you just, it, 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 to some extent your behavior is a choice and you got to choose to do better. Yeah, for sure. So I, I have next to no, I pretty much have no sympathy for Charles. He's just like a piece of garbage to me, but yeah. And then I'm, how are we feeling? <laughs> yeah, definitely took a different turn. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. I think we no, kind of you, expected you had it, the surprising so... dark. Yeah, you had the surprising dark turn last episode. Now I have the yeah the, the dark turn this episode. So I think we're balanced out now. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then next week we can have fairly similar. Yeah, James Dean and Audrey Hepburn. I love Audrey Hepburn. I love her story. What I know about it already. I haven't done my whole deep dive yet, but I know that there's some good talking points in there, and I'm looking yeah. forward to it. So. Well, like I think that's definitely. It's definitely an episode where we kind of are a bit more on, like, a similar level of understanding because, like, I do know a lot about Audrey Hepburn because I've loved her for so long. Like, yeah. one of my skating routines was to breakfast at Tiffany's and stuff because <laughs> so I was like, I need to do it. It's good music and it's Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> yeah. And I used to have, like, Audrey Hepburn mm-hmm. posters and, like, paintings up in my room and stuff. Yeah, she's... an. Uh... She's an absolute gem of a human being. Um, James Dean, I can't claim to know very much about. I know that there's some stuff with his car that he died in a car crash. 
I don't remember. I, I remember his car was involved, and I remember um, there was an episode in Supernatural about the car being haunted, and so that's kind of what I know about James Dean. <laughs> yeah, no, that is part of it, but because I've already, mm -hmm. I've done my whole script for it already. <laughs> You're so far ahead of me all the time. <laughs> I don't have much more yeah. to do right now. That's fair. <laughs> but yeah. All right. Yeah. On that note, take care of yourself today. If someone tells you to stop trusting your own brain and to trust theirs instead, don't. <laughs> yeah. Go outside, go for a walk, get some fresh air, do anything to improve your mental health other than take LSD. Yeah, pretty that's, much. <laughs> that's our takeaway from this episode. <laughs> and don't be afraid to speak out. Oh my god, yes, When it comes yes. to things like this. Yeah. Take a note from Nellie Bly. Yeah. <laughs> Write letters. Yes. Yeah, stand up. Take your place. So take that this space. things like this don't happen for as long as they do. Yeah, right? So that's so often what it takes is just like one person being like, hey, do something. And then everything kind of yeah it, it like it's hard it's hard and it takes time and it takes the know-how of like how to actually go about doing it effectively but like but just the changes the changes that are made when people do that is phenomenal yeah all right all right all right on that note we'll see you next time <laughs>